Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Zola Levitt presents. Considering the times and seasons of our world today, here's Zola Levitt. Shalom. Hello again. Now, in tonight's program, I want you to open your mind, as I had to, listening to our guest. Our guest is very special and very different. He is Dr. Gerald Schroeder. He has degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the famous MIT, his bachelor's, his master's, his doctorate. He was seven years on the faculty there. He has seen six atomic bombs go off, which is to say he was one of the observers and scientists on those projects. Uh, he uh, moved to Jerusalem 20-some years ago. He is a, an eminent uh, nuclear physicist. He, he knows his stuff. But beyond that, he knows the scriptures. He's a Bible man. He has uh, studied cosmology origins, the beginning, especially in terms of Genesis and its story of creation. And he has some very fascinating ideas. Gerald believes that the world was created in six 24-hour days, evening, morning, a day, evening, morning, two days, six of those for creation. He also believes that the world is 15 billion years old, and what confounds me, Gerald, is you believe that that 15 billion years we see in our fossils and so on, some say, and those six days are the same period of time. Yes, I do. <laughs> a bit of silence, yeah. It's a, hard, it's a hard act to follow, but yeah, I do. And I mean six 24-hour days as measured on a watch. Not make-believe days, real days. And I believe 15 billion years also as measured on a watch if the battery would last. And they both happen in the same time. The six 24-hour days, days as we know them, and the 15 billion years as we know them occur in the same time. And that's the heritage of the book of Genesis and of Albert Einstein. And it's, it's a merely a reality seen from two different perspectives of the same reality. And that's the key to trying to understand the text of the Bible, that it sees the world from perspectives that are different necessarily than we're used to. Mm -hmm. The very idea that we have to dig deeper into the text is pretty clear. As you said, evening and morning. Each of the days goes there is evening and morning, day one. Evening and morning, a second day. More things have happened. This is, we're going through the six days of Genesis. Evening and morning, a third day. And we come to the fourth day and we discover the sun. I mean, what we're learning here. Yeah, <laughs> it's that, just created on the fourth, the fourth day. day. Yeah, we have the sun appearing on the fourth day. We would wonder why we have evening and morning for the first three days. The author of the Bible, I mean, God, I don't think it's a mistake, right? I mean, I, you know, in other words, it's teaching us something. That to understand evening and morning and days, even though the days are 24 hours each, we have to dig deeper into the text. There's a text and a subtext. Uh -huh. And every ancient commentary says the same thing. The six days of Genesis are 24-hour days but they contain all the ages of the universe. <laughs> six 24-hour days contain the ages of the universe. Six days like this, true days, contain the billions of years, and they both happen in the same time. You're sort of telling me I can pour a, a, a gallon jug of milk into a thimble. Almost. Almost, but not quite. But you, you might be able to. Yeah. If not milk, because milk's not compressible. Uh -huh. But you could pour a gallon jug of hydrogen gas into a thimble, couldn't mm -hmm. you? Because you could compress the hydrogen gas into a thimble. Okay. And I think time is more like an expandable gas uh -huh. than an incompressible uh -huh. liquid. So had the Bible wanted to say the days were eras, not, as you hear many apologists today say, oh, we don't really mean day, we mean era. Well, the biblical, biblical Hebrew, not the Hebrew of today even, but biblical Hebrew, when the number of words is much smaller, mm -hmm. there weren't borrowed words like telephone. I mean, if you come to Israel, you can use the telephone. <laughs> Did you know? right. yeah, telephone no. is Hebrew for telephone. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. If the Bible wanted to say era, there's a word, kufa, ona. Moad, meaning indescribable but long periods of time. The Bible didn't have to say. Like era or eon or age. Exactly. Uh, yeah. it, the Bible could have said there was the first eon, 
the first mm -hmm. Kufa. Mm -hmm. There was the second Eon. Mm -hmm. The second Kufa. It didn't have to say evening and morning a day. And evening and morning are Arab and Boker. That's the Hebrew, and the, it's commonly and understood. It's understood. Again, understanding, just, just to jump off on it, to see for deeper meaning in, in more, one of the more easier approaches to understanding a depth within the text. Erev and Boker before the sun raises a bit of a problem for an adult reader once he looks into the text. Yeah, evening and morning. Evening and morning. How do they yeah. exist before? Yeah, before the sun. And so the Kabbalah, a tradition that goes back thousands of years before thermodynamics. Before, I mean, my undergraduate work at MIT had lots of thermo, chemical engineering, lots of thermodynamics in it. My graduate was in physics. I wish I'd have been around a few thousand years ago. I would have liked to have made this statement. What does the Kabbalah tell us? That when you look at these words and you see the sun on day four, and evening and morning for the first three days, and all the other six days as well, it can't be meaning evening and morning. Let's look at the root of the word. The Hebrew is a shorish. The root of the word erev, ayin reish beit, which mm -hmm. is translated as evening, mm -hmm. means chaos, disorder. Mm -hmm. And the root of the word morning, boker, beit kuf reish, means orderly, able to be discerned. Why does evening mean chaos? Because when the sun goes down in the evening, it's dark. <laughs> vision becomes blurry, yeah. chaotic. That's why in Hebrew you call it evening Chaos, literally. Yes, uh, yeah. And Boker, orderly, able to be discerned, like be court, to visit. So you have a flow here, not from sunset to sunrise. That's why God told us and mentioned that even if the sun was present before, the fact that God mentions the sun on day four and not until day four comes to say, Zola, Gerald, everyone. Look deeper into the text, mm -hmm. and you'll see a phenomenal thing, a flow from evening to morning, a flow from disorder to order, higher and higher and higher levels of order. Through so the six days of Genesis, we start off, the world was unformed and void, right? The second verse of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Artists were at tohu vavohu. The earth was unformed and void, mm -hmm. a chaos. And you end up six days later the symphony of life, humanity. Yeah. And the Bible wants you to be amazed by this. Yes. And, it wants, and it tells you this, there was evening and there was, no, no, there was disorder and there was order, higher and higher levels of order. And we have to be amazed by this, that the laws of nature could take a chaos, a, a, a tohu vavohu, a, an unformed earth, and end up with trees, beautiful, humans. And it flows higher and higher levels of order. And, and anyone that studies either statistics or thermodynamics knows that order can never arise from disorder by random processes. It cannot happen. Statistically, the flow is always to greater levels of disorder. Oh, you just have to study the top of my desk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, you, I remember you saying this in Jerusalem, that it, 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 it implies a director, a leader, to cause uh, order to rise from chaos. Something is built into the system. When God creates the universe, it isn't just time, space, and matter that's created. There's time, space, matter, and the laws of nature, these phenomenal things. God-given gifts to the world that write us into the universe. The most secular of scientists whom I know, when they study the conditions of the universe back here mm -hmm. in relationship to the laws of nature, say, it's clear to them the universe knew we were coming. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's fascinating. We're, we are written into the universe. It was created to, to support life, to make life and to support it. Yeah, it's, which is a fairly biblical statement for an atheist, or let's say an agnostic. I don't like to say a person that atheist, agnostics, they're searching. They haven't yeah, got but those answer. scientists say that even though they're not believers, yeah. they can see that the universe was created to make life and to sustain it. And Tuned for life. Their words are the... Tuned for I, life. I can yes. tell you... Uh, we're in Dallas in Austin, Texas. Stephen Weinberg, Nobel Prize winner, writes in Scientific American mm -hmm. in October 1994. Scientific American is the most widely read science journal in the world. Mm -hmm. This is a person who, who in his own writing says he feels that the Bible is, is, is a myth. Mm -hmm. His words are, the universe is incredibly, this is where it is, in, the universe is incredibly finely tuned for life. Mm. And now, 
Now, back to your 15 yeah. billion years at six, that you have them on the same line there. Yeah, because I wanted just to, the idea of the evening and the morning to show that we have to understand even day. Let's get into something deeper meanings, like we got into deeper meaning of evening and morning. Maybe there's something in the word day that perhaps Einstein can give us a bit of a, a clue how six 24-hour days can contain all the ages of the universe. Okay. There's a hint to this in Psalms. Remember Psalm 90, verse 4? A thousand years in your sight are like a day that passes. That's repeated in the New like Testament. The yeah, the, uh, 2 Peter 3, 8, on to the Lord a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Okay, so. and, and the same, th well, what are we learning here? We're learning that maybe there are, di perhaps there are different perspectives. Does what, when the Bible looks at time, perhaps it's a day, perhaps it's a watch in the night, that we would look in time and see a thousand years or a millennia, mm -hmm. who knows, billions of years. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're trying to, uh, what I would say, to try to understand how six 24-hour days can contain all the ages of the universe. So there are a few clues to this inside the text, even in the five books of Moses, okay? These, these books, the five books of Moses, especially Genesis, are all mankind's heritage, and it's the heritage for the Western world. They've changed the world. And first thing I notice, is that when I'm looking at the description of time, as we move along the timeline, there's a break at Adam and Eve, okay? And that break is as follows. The description of time for the six days is quite bizarre. It says, and we were saying before, and there was evening and morning a day, other things happening, evening and morning a, stage, a second day, a third. In other words, there was evening and morning. But from Adam forward, that description, that rather, almost abstract description, like you're looking in from the outside, there was evening and morning, there was evening and morning, that is never repeated in the entire Hebrew Bible. Okay. For the rest of the text, it's Adam and Eve live 130 years, they're the parents of Seth, Seth lives 105 years, he's the father of Enosh, and so on. From Adam forward, the passage of human life drags on time. From Adam forward, time is human time. Because with Adam and Eve, the soul of human life is created and implanted on the earth. The neshama, the Hebrew word for the soul of human life, the neshama appears and the biblical time becomes linked with human time. Before the neshama, before the soul of human life, the Bible can be seeing the world from anywhere. And that's really the key, isn't it, that the Bible can see the world from okay. anywhere. All right. We're going to have to go to a break, but uh, you stay tuned. And after this, uh, Dr. Gerald Schroeder will explain how 15 billion years fits into six days and nights. Come with Zola Levitt and see for yourself the land of the covenant. Uh, other people said they went on cruises or, and trips like this, and it was all historical, and they saw a lot of size, but this was spiritual, and this was really good. So I'm really glad I picked Zola Levitt's uh, group to tour the Holy Land. Tour the Holy Land with Zola Levitt. Call or write for more information. Well, that's Israel, and you can see it with us, and uh, you can see Gerald probably because we're going to invite him to speak to our group, and that's that's really going to stretch their minds, I think. I hope it's stretching yours. It it, it certainly stretches mine. When he was in Jerusalem, uh, he wrote Genesis and the Big Bang, and the Science of God. We're not offering these books because you can get them in any bookstore. Uh, this one, uh, look, uh, let me put it this way: I have a lot of guests on the program, and I I look at their books. I, I read the fly leaves. I read the guy's biography. I read a couple of pages. But I read both these books, and this it's not easy reading, frankly. And I had one physics course in college, but uh, they were fascinating. A terrific read, Gerald. That, that, and the thing I discovered was that you really can show from the theory of relativity that. The 15 billion years and the six days really are the same thing? It's phenomenal, Zola. And what's exciting is the numbers are not my numbers. Uh -huh. The numbers are numbers that appear in every physics textbook. These books have undergone peer review by scientists. The science that are, is in them is true. The numbers that we're about to talk about are numbers that appear in physics laboratories around the world, in reviewed journals around the world. Okay. And let's get to the, the, the five numbers. We mentioned the chart a moment ago. Can I explain a bit of it? Please. Okay, what's here is essentially a timeline, and it, it shows uh, the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, 
Okay, at the Our, beginning, everything was in a small P and he, it yeah, blew up. Creation, okay. which is important itself. I and mean, we remember now that science has come to accept the fact there was a creation. I said, oh, we, we have to all remember. Just 40 years ago, most scientists said, beginning? There's no beginning. The oh, universe yeah, is eternal. Right, yeah. It's amazing. Everyone, science has come to confirm the first word of the Bible. There was a creation. The in the beginning is now scientific fact. Okay. The Big Bang. And then the timeline runs, comes here through six days to Adam and Eve, and continues and comes to a number less, somewhat less than 6,000 years. This number appears often, but there's a question. We'll use this number as a working number, somewhat less than 6,000 years. It's the Jewish year this It's year. the Jewish year, okay. yeah, this, this year. Uh, get taken by adding up the generations. Okay. So we have this flow of time, and we have six days here. As we mentioned before, before the break, these days are separate because they're described separately, right? The described set. Moses breaks it. In, if you, anyone looks into Deuteronomy chapter 32, to verse 7, we'll see that Moses says, consider the days of old, the years of the many generations. So Moses himself in his last dinner says, shape up folks, if you want to see God in the world, if this doesn't blow you away with phenomenal of the science of the six days, then watch the social history. Yeah. But the six days of Genesis, consider the days of old, the years of the generations from Adam forward. We're dealing with these six days. And the question is, how can six days contain all the ages of the universe? Because down here is a timeline that's not biblical, it's scientific. Uh -huh. and it starts off about 15 billion years ago with the creation, then the beginning of time. The Kabbalah tells us the time starts a slight bit after the creation, when time separates out. The physics says exactly the same thing today. It's beautiful. I mean, it's, it gives you chills sometimes how science has come to match the Bible. The Bible doesn't change. Science makes not gigantic changes, but little, like, it's like yeah. pouring water in a funnel. It's not that science is jumping all over. It has started out with a big picture, and it's focusing in. And you know what it's focusing in on? Genesis. Yes. That's what it's focusing in on. And that's, we have here now a timeline beginning. It runs for 15 billion years, and it comes today. The, the key is, as, as, as you, you mentioned, when the universe was, was first began, Kabbalah told us 2,000 years ago, and now physics tells us about the last 40 years, the universe is a tiny speck. The entire universe. God was there. <laughs> Every, God was God is here now also, but, but the whole entire universe, it wasn't a speck in a vacuum, a vacuum of space. The entire universe, everything was inside. It was energy. Okay. And this energy expands out, changes into matter, and the universe expands to a huge size today. Yes. Now look what this, this has to do with, with the... With the phenomena of time. It turns out, we can't draw this to scale, obviously, that this circle, this is the universe today, and this universe is the beginning. If I take the numbers that are listed in every major physics textbook, for example, uh, the Big Bang by Joseph Silk, okay, published by W.H. Freeman, 100% secular science. We learned today that the universe is a million, million times, it's called the scale of the universe, the size, mm -hmm. the scale is the jargon, is a million, million times larger today than it was then. One million squared. A million. And now what does this mean, a million, million, a million squared? It means that the space of, of the universe has been stretching and stretching and stretching and stretching. And look what this would do to a piece of information. Supposing we're back here when the universe is small, okay? And we have a consciousness back here, God, giving us the information of the Bible. Not out here at Sinai, but being formed back here at the beginning, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we were told, I'll just take an example. That, that God has a laser, <laughs> okay. a, a pulse of light, Boop, sends out a yeah. pulse of light. Now, light travels at 186,000 miles a second. That's faster than Ken's Corvette. You know, yes. I mean, 186,000 <laughs> miles a second, and the first pulse of light comes out, and on that light is imprinted, I'm sending you a pulse of light every second. Just a slice of light that's going to travel through space, and imprinted on that light is I'm sending you a pulse every second. A second later, another pulse comes out, another pulse. But those pulses are separated by 186,000 miles, right? Because yeah. that's how far we're traveling a second. Yeah. And we'll pretend this is the separation. Okay. And now they're going to travel for millions and billions of years until they reach us here in Dallas. We have a big dish antenna, and we're searching space for it. And bingo, they arrive. The first pulse arrives. And written on it is, I'm sending a pulse every second. But look what has happened in the past. The pulse is left. One, one. I just do two pulses. Yeah. 
You know, they're going to travel for billions of years. But Zola, while they're traveling, what's happening to the universe? Is it getting it's, larger? Yeah, it's expanding. It's, it's expanding. Yeah. Space is stretching. So as these pulses travel through space, what's happening? They get further and further apart. They get further and further and further hmm. apart. And bingo, the first sliver arises. And we get it on a big dish antenna. Yeah. And you say, you Zola, you call your friend, come on, let's watch these deck up. And you drink it, burn all. The next second, turn up the gain, you know, the amplification. Second goes by, doesn't pass. A year goes by, you still hear get gray, we get grayer. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Where's the, yeah, the Where's the one. second pulse? Well, was, was it alive back here? Was it a second? Yeah. Yes, it was a second. But by the time that information reaches us here, it's so stretched out that it could be a year apart. Yeah a million years or a billion years, depending upon the amount of stretching. And which would be true? Would it be that the pulses arrive every second? Or would it be that they would arrive every, or we'll put it this way, is it true that the pulses were sent out in one second apart? Is it true that we received them a year apart? Yeah. It depends where you are. It depends upon your perspective of time. Yeah. The Bible says, and there was evening and there was morning, day one. And there was evening and morning, a second day, a third day, a fourth day. So the commentaries ask, why does the Bible say there was evening and morning day one? That's Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. Why didn't the Bible say there was evening and morning a first day? The Hebrew is explicit, Yom Echad, mm -hmm. day well, one. Day one. It does not say Yom Rishon. I'm sure you have many in the audience day. that know Hebrew. Yeah. You know, it says Yom Echad, day one. The second day says Yom Sheni, a second day. Yom Shlishi, a third day, a fourth day, a fifth day, the sixth day. Mm -hmm. But the first day says day one. Why does the Bible say day one, we're asked, 2,000 years ago? And the Bible says day one, we're told, to teach us two things. One is that one, the word one is absolute. The word first is comparative. Mm -hmm. The fact that the Bible tells us day one tells us, first of all, that at this time there was no time with which to compare it. No, it's the beginning. It's the beginning. And that the Bible is seeing time from the beginning. That's why it has to say day one. The Bible looks forward in time and sees the universe from this perspective squeezed back down to its perspective. Uh, Gerald, let me recap, as I understand it, and of course I've had the advantage of hearing you say this before on our upcoming show, and also at lunch, but uh, let, me, let me say it my way, okay. The 15 billion years and the six days are the same thing, but they're looked at from different points. If, if I'm standing back where the Big Bang occurred from, uh, right where the little dot is, I look out there and I only see six days of creation. But standing out here on the earth at this time, looking back at the history, because the, the light coming in from those distant expanded stars has so stretched out, I see 15 billion years of history. And it, it really is 15 billion history, and it really is six days, depends where you stand. It's like if, I, if I'm in a class in geometry and the teacher draws a square on the blackboard, and I happen to be in the center of the front row, I look at it and it's a square. I come to class the next day and I'm seated way over at the side of the room. Now I look at that blackboard, and that square has turned into a rectangle so from where down. I'm at. If I back up far enough, the square is just a dot. I don't see a, a figure at all. And it depends, in that case, space dilates according to my perspective. Well, time simply does the same thing. That's the, is it, isn't it phenomenal? That's Einstein's discovery, that time does the same thing as space. Well, Gerald, it's not just phenomenal. It has relaxed my thinking because for 25 years I've been a little bit shifty. I wrote a book called Creation of Scientist Choice many years ago with a creation scientist. He insisted on six days and six literal days and so forth and didn't like the Big Bang and so on. I have to confess a little discomfort. I wrote what he said, but I had trouble with, with fossils, with, with history, with geology, and so forth. But this takes it all in for me. It was six days, and it was 15 billion years. And it's scientifically correct. I make that very clear. It's scientifically correct. I can give you a may I quote just. Please. I mean, yeah, a quote from the science of God. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, what's extraordinary here is that this is a quote from Peebles book, The Principles of Physical Cosmology. This is a book in graduate school cosmology used around the world. It's certainly one of the two or three, maybe the best book on cosmology, graduate level, the, uh, the science, cosmology, the science 
of the universe, yeah. principles of physical cosmology. And he used a ter uses the term the redshift. The redshift is this stretching of space, okay? okay. So yeah. that's what you have to remember. I want to quote directly. That's what it means. The standard interpretation of the redshift as an effect of the expansion of the universe yeah. predicts that the same redshift factor, the same stretching factor, applies to the observed rates the observed rates of occurrence of distant events. That's exactly what you just said in English, as opposed to yeah, yeah. cosmology. Scientific gibberish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that the same exact number. And what's so phenomenal, Zola, is I didn't pick out the number. That's the principle. Yeah. So I said, that's interesting. Let's see what the number was. I went to probably a dozen textbooks written by people who have no vested interest in this book, my friend, none whatsoever in, 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 the, in the Bible. In the Bible, yeah. And the same number appears again and again. If you want to take this as a grouping, as a, a later, another time, I hope you can talk about it each day, but take this as a grouping, the ratio the difference in the expansion rate, which is then the, the rates of observed events, is a million times a million, a million squared. That's a one with 12 zeros after it. Any one of your viewers on the back of an envelope can make that calculation now. Okay, let me tell you how I made it. I'm going to have to close. Gerald, thanks so much for being with us, and we will make another program on that uh, chart of the individual days. Uh, listen, do this on your calculator. It's quite simple. Put 15 billion years, or take off some zeros of your calculator it won't hold all that and equal it out with the other numbers but anyway you're going to divide 15 billion by 1 million squared the one with the 12 zeros you'll get 0 0.015 of a year now you multiply that 0 0.015 times 365 days and you will get approximately six days it's just that's anybody can do. You can do it with a pencil. Yeah. I mean, in a minute. You don't have to be a physicist. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> well, okay, now you're going to write to me and say, well, this, this, this unbeliever, this scientist. <laughs> don't do that. He's just a scientist, and he's uh, certainly a Bible man. A uh, fascinating person to talk to, and uh, his books, Genesis and the Big Bang, The Science of God, get them and read them for yourself. We can't really do justice to a subject like this in 30-minute television programs, obviously. Uh, write to us and get our newsletter, and it'll keep you up with uh, events in Israel, like, uh, like our meeting of Gerald and so forth. Our newsletter is free. Just send us your name and address, and uh, we'll uh, send it to you. You can uh, uh, write to us at the post office box for that. Uh, and our catalog request our catalog which gives all of the offers of all of the, the programs of all of the years our, our video series uh, going on back with fascinating interviews like this and remember the funds folks that's how we really keep going that's how we can get to Israel and, and meet people like Gerald Schroeder and Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim pray for the peace of Jerusalem mm -hmm.